languages, people. It's so nice to see everyone. Okay, you guys know the rules. No boring questions, please. It's Thursday. We, we need as much excitement as we can to wrap the week up. Um, feel free to type anything in the chat and I will send the question to Steve. We've already, I know, I know, I'm not supposed to talk the good stuff before the call starts, but I couldn't help it. The guy's fascinating. So I'll throw, we've got an interesting conversation going I'd like to pick up on. But first, Steve Campbell was a techie, is a narrator, has a love of, ever, I literally don't know that much because I've never met Steve before this call, but I know Steve by reputation. I've heard Steve's narrating. Steve is amazing. Steve is well loved by all of you. And I want to know about 10 year old Steve. <laughs> what were your dreams? What were your plans? What, who, what was 10 year old Steve like? Oh gosh. You know, it's funny because I went to a school that was uh, um, private and non-traditional. And so I didn't have grades. And usually that's how people remember how old they were is I was in grade four. Or I was in grade two. And I went to the same school from kindergarten to grade 12. And we didn't really have grades per se. So it all blends together. So knowing what I was doing at 10, I can kind of guess, but it's not super clear to me. Um what do you mean not great? So no labels or anything? Was it like, that actually sounds was, kind of cool. Was it like a hippie school? No, no, it was a, it was a private school. It was a Christian school. And so okay. we had um, uh, the, the curriculum that we used was called ACE, Accelerated Christian Education. And uh, rather than be in a traditional classroom, your guys are not going to believe you're going to be like, no, that's not real. That didn't happen. We had, we didn't have teachers. We had supervisors. And we would work in booklets that were called paces. And rather than be in a classroom setting where we had all the desks facing one way and there was a teacher at the front at the chalkboard giving you all the information, we sat in little cubicle of cubicles lining the walls of the room. They were little desks, sort of, that were mounted on the wall. And you would face the wall and you would have these dividers on either side of you that separated every student from one another. And you would work. It was all self-directed. So you would open up your booklet. It would have little cartoon panels that would give you instructions on what you were supposed to do on that particular page or in that section. And you would read through it. You would answer the questions. You would do whatever you needed to do. And then you would get to like the end of a page or the end of two pages. And then it would have a little box at the bottom that said, you need to check your work. And so you would, you had two different flags. You had a Canadian flag because I was raised, born and raised in Canada and you had a Christian flag. And the Canadian flag was the one that you would use for the monitors and monitors were like the volunteers, often moms or whatever that would come in and would monitor the situation and answer little questions like I need to go to the bathroom or whatever. And you would take your flag and you put it up in your divider so that it was there and then they acknowledge that you needed help. And the monitor would come over and whisper, what can I do for you? And you would say, I need to go check my work. And they would say, okay, go to the up. And so you would go up into the middle of the room and there'd be a scoring table there. And you'd find your answer key, which was a little book that had all the correct answers in it. And you would take that over to the table. You'd line them up and you would check all your answers to compare whether you got things right or wrong. You'd mark all the ones you got wrong. And then you would close the booklet, put the key back, and then go back to your desk and you would correct any mistakes that you made, write in the right answers, put your flag back up, and then the in monitor would come back over. What do you need? I need to go recheck my work. It would say, okay. Then you go back up to the table, make sure you had it all right, and go back and then continue on with your day. And then if you had questions about the information or you didn't understand something, then you would put your supervisor's flag up. And that was a Christian one, and you'd put that one up. And then the supervisor would come over, what do you need? And you would say, I don't understand this. And they would try and explain it to you. And then you would move along. And so these packlets, depending on what age you were in, would have 50 to 100 pages in them. Once you finished the booklet, you would do a self-test at the very end, which was a summary of everything that you learned in that booklet. And then you would hand it in uh, and the supervisor or the supervisor would check it all over and say, okay, I think you're ready for your test tomorrow. And then you would take that, he would take that booklet away. And then the very next day you would go to the testing table and you would sit down and you would write a test based on all of the, all the information that was in that booklet. And you had to pass 
uh, I think it was up until about grade nine, you had to pass with 90%. After grade nine, you had to pass with 80% on that test. If you passed it, then they would give you a new booklet and you would start that booklet and you had different booklets for every subject and that was how it went. So wherever you finished off in the year, that's the pace that you would start the very next year when you came back after summer holidays. So it all blended together. It wasn't like we had grade five and grade six and that kind of stuff. It was, did it was you, really odd. Did you like play with your friends and everything? And it, well, it's, I can't decide if it sounds really cool and futuristic or kind of <laughs> stressful. <laughs> it's, you know, it was good. It was, if you were self-motivated yeah, and you were able to, you know, be self-disciplined enough to do your work it was fantastic there were kids that would fly through the information and graduate when they were 15 16 years old um but then there was people like me who uh, had adhd and were procrastinators and i really struggled because i was uh, a high functioning adhd so I oh, so had it's... like the intelligence was there yeah. but i was irritated with the tedium of the process if yeah. something fe i felt challenged by i would be really excited about it there was one pace in particular yeah. it was pace 79 in math and everyone dreaded this it was like the reputation of like oh no this is the worst pace ever because some students would fail it like five times over and just couldn't get past this test and there was um two two of my friends who were in that year one was the principal's daughter who was always on the honor roll and another was another friend who was who did pretty good with his studies. Um, she had failed it three times and he had failed it four or five times. And so when when it came my turn to do the test, do that pace, I was a little bit nervous. And I was like, oh, boy, what's this going to be like? And uh, I started getting into it. And it was your introduction to algebra. And I finished the pace in like record time. Like it took me two days. I finished the entire thing and I passed with ninety nine point seven percent. And the only, I had like, I was one decimal off on like one answer. And I was like, why was everybody dread? Like, this was amazing. I love this stuff. And it was because it was finally interesting and compelling to me. Yeah. And so then I was able to breeze through it right quick, quickly. But the problem for me was, is that I just, I couldn't be bothered to motivate myself because I found it boring. And if something did, was boring, I wasn't Did the teachers recognize in. that your different working patterns and work around it? Or was it the one system for everyone and you either fit or you didn't? It was the one system. Yeah. It was See, the one system. I and there was like a you. way to slip through the cracks. Yeah. Yeah. I was, if a class bored me, I remember clocking that a class was 30 minutes long and that your average sitcom on TV was 30 minutes long. And mm -hmm. so I would memorize the TV shows I'd watched the night before and I'd replay them in my head during class if I had a boring class, mm -hmm. which is odd. <laughs> but, well, and it's, you know. Yeah. The thing is, is bored. They, they called these booklets paces because it was work at your own pace. So yeah. the good and the bad thing was, is that if you were struggling with a concept or, you know, in a classroom setting, traditionally, you would have some students who weren't quite getting it. And so the people who got it right away would have to trudge along waiting for the people who yeah. did, you know, would eventually get it, waiting for them to go. And then they would be bored in a disruption and that kind of challenge. But for me... Um, it was just, I was very social. I was very extroverted and I really had a hard time just being there by myself, just focusing on doing work, but In I would have cubicle. moments of hyper-focus. So I would go for months without doing a, a stitch of score, not a stitch. And then I would do a month or a month and a half of work in one week and just fly through everything. And they'd be like, oh my goodness. Cause I would just have this burst of motivation to just really rock everything and get everything done. And then it would, there was no real reward or gratification for that. And so it would just lose interest. And I would go back to, well, I'm just going to sit here quietly and not do anything. So what about social yeah. interaction? You'd had recess um, that you could recess lunch. Uh, phys ed, like Jim was, was all together and communal drama was together. That's why I loved Jim and drama. Those were like my, yes, finally, because everything else was yeah. very, individualized you didn't have group projects you didn't have you know um question and answers you didn't have discussion time it wasn't like you had a book that you were all reading and then you had to discuss it none of that was even an option for you so yeah it was very solitary so did and it for make someone it... who was introverted 
and uh, liked to do that stuff. They would really, really gravitate toward us and just fly through stuff. It was great for them. Not so much for me. Did you have plan? Did you have like dreams about your future? Like, did you have a vision of your future when you got out of the school? Like, how hard was it going to someplace so different and so outside the norm, and then just going into the flow of the norm when you get out of it when everyone else has been raised differently? How hard is that? Well, you know, it's funny. I mean, growing up in the church, growing up in a Christian bubble, the 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 sad thing was. Um, there was a couple of things working against me. One was um, most of my family hadn't graduated at that point. None of my brothers had graduated. Uh, most of my cousins hadn't graduated. My mom dropped out at grade nine. Mo all of my aunts and uncles had dropped out when they were quite young. Um, my it all grandma gone to those never... type of schools, right? Well, no, no. This I, We were the first generation to really do that. Well, my, my older cousin, who's 15 years older than me, he had gone to that type of school as well. Okay. And then actually the school in my between my grade 10 and my grade 11 year, the schools realized that this curriculum, this program wasn't quite working for them. So they ended up going to a, uh, a provincial credited curriculum. It was still a Christian school, but they used BC, which is the province that I grew up in, approved accredited information. And before that time, none of our teachers needed to be accredited. So, so you were having teachers or principals or whatever who weren't actually you know, they didn't go to school to become teachers. They didn't have like a uh, a, ba a BA in, in education. That's or anything dangerous like that. because you could end up with one of those, like sometimes I listen to those true crime podcasts. You <laughs> could end up with like one of them charismatic characters that jumps in and like. <laughs> oh, definitely, definitely. But the idea was that this PACE program, it was used very commonly in homeschooling. Uh, it was a curriculum that was really catered towards homeschooling because all of the information was right there. It was mm. there for you to have. So if the student didn't quite understand what they're reading, hopefully an adult who was reading through it could understand what they were doing and then help the student through it. But yeah, I agree. It was not, it was not ideal. And then thankfully my last two years were done um, in a more traditional type of setting with classrooms and teachers at the chalkboards and, and that kind of thing going through instructions which was so a very what did difficult you transition love? when you were going through that school what made you happy did you have something you loved doing when you got home from school were you a tv guy were you like a radio guy did you like do hobbies or read books what what, what did 10 year olds or you know young steve what did you love and feel passionate about um i grew up i grew up loving tv and movies a lot um, it was kind of this thing where, uh, my mom had been remarried when I was about, well, actually right around, I was about eight years old, uh, when she remarried and, uh, he was a, he was a good guy, but he had never, um, he never learned how to be a kid himself. He started going to work, I think when he was about 11 years old. And so he, uh, he Not was, ideal. <laughs> he was very controlling <laughs> He had had some issues in his past of being deceived. And so he was always thinking that people, you know, thought he was dumb and he would get angry. And he's like, do you think I'm stupid? Do you think I don't know what's going on? And uh, and so he didn't know how to interact with people really well. And that was challenging for a person who was my mom with three boys that didn't, we had kind of just done our own thing and we're pretty independent. And then we come into this where he would get angry at us for doing things that arguably we shouldn't be doing, but we're just things boys did, right? Like and am I right that you quickly that kind of become stuff. good at managing other grown-ups' emotions? You quickly become good at being the vessel for those emotions and learning to make sure they don't go off. <laughs> yeah, well, it was kind of funny because my brothers and I, um, my two, I had one brother who's eight years older than I am. I have another brother who's two years and two weeks younger than I am. And then I have another brother from my mom who was uh, 10 years younger than I was. Quite a difference between between all of us. And so for, for quite a while, it was just the three of us boys with my mom. And then uh, when she got remarried a couple of years into that, or maybe a year or two into that, two years into that, she had another, uh, she had another child, another son. And so he was quite young, but he was like the Joseph of our family because yeah. he was the favored son that was both of theirs, right? And so my my stepdad really, really 
spoiled him quite a bit. But for us, what ended up happening was my two other brothers were very non-confrontational. So anytime my, my dad would get angry or he would try and, you know, give them grief about something, uh, they would just back right off and they would just, you know, get defensive or they would make excuses and they'd walk away. Myself, I was more like I was so concerned about justice and what was right. And I it love created... little Steve. I want to. <laughs> <laughs> he created a lot of problems for himself because <laughs> I would. I didn't. It didn't matter. I didn't care who you were. If I thought you were wrong, I let you knew. I let you know. And so I got in trouble in school a lot. Uh, I got in trouble everywhere I went a lot. And uh, and with my dad, it became a problem because I would just he would get at me and if I, if I felt like he was wrong or he wasn't right, I would yell right back at him. And so I got smacked a couple of times. And, uh, and there was one point where my mom, a lot of times my mom would jump in between and try and stop it. And my dad would get really mad. You're always defending them. You're always protecting them and you're not letting them, you know, deal with the consequences of their actions. And so at one point she just had to step away. And I was a bit older by that time. I think it was probably in my early teens. And uh, she had to just step away and be like, they're going to kill each other, but I just have to let them deal with what they're dealing with. And she just went into her room and cried and prayed, she said, and, and, uh, and then it got real quiet. And she's like, Oh no, one of them must be dead. Something's wrong. What's happening. And she came back out and we were both quietly talking. And so my, my dad and I, we butted heads really hard, but then eventually it got to the place where we were able to, you know, calmly, you know, kind of talk it out. And so he respected me more, but he was also harder on me for that. I wonder, so. do you know, I just had a thought because the thought occurred to me when you're describing the school that like, you always wonder what it would be like if you had a different situation or and then you have to always, we always have to remind ourselves, well, if I had a different situation, I wouldn't be the person I am today. But I wonder if you're learning the ADHD, you said, if mm. that in the environment that you were in, which wasn't conducive to, to working around it it feels like you tell me if i'm wrong you had to develop you couldn't be part of the herd you had to develop a really strong individual me at a very young age and with that came the sense of right and wrong the sense of i'm going to hold my own the sense of i can stare this big grown up down and still be sure of myself. So I wonder if that did do you a favor on so many levels, that, because what an asset to have throughout your life, to have this strong sense of this is who I am, that you can always, we don't all have that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, there was at one point where I was, I got pretty annoyed because I felt like my little brother who was 10 years younger than I was, who was like, it felt like it was handed the world on a platter. And if he made a mistake, you know, the parents would come in and rescue him from that or, you know, fix things for him. And, uh, you know, I was feeling a bit jealous of the fact that like he had been given so much and I was given so little. Like I joke about the fact, it, I don't think I originated the phrase, but we had to, when I was growing up, we had to save up to be poor. Um, and so, especially when it was a single mom with three boys, she would buy her clothes at the Sally Ann and I would beg her, please don't buy my underwear there at least. Can I have new underwear, please, please? And, uh, and so we were teased quite a lot growing up because you're the one wearing all the hand-me-down clothes that weren't in style, weren't in fashion. And so- But that is I good up, for you, really good. It is. When you buy something now, because yeah, I know that. We, we were the kids plus the Italian father. We had calamara mm -hmm. in our lunch boxes mm -hmm. in the suburbs. Our, my fellow students drove Jaguars. I was like, can I have a dollar to share between my sister and I? Maybe. And it was like a big day. But yeah. do you not find now, I find that like, I can buy like a faux fur scarf for like five pounds online. And I am so excited. I'm like a 90 yeah. year old woman. because <laughs> Like the value of little stuff it's so big of a deal. I'm glad I wasn't one of those Jaguar kids when I was 15. Absolutely. Yeah. You There's, know what I mean? You know, it's funny. They do so many studies where they talk about how hard times create hard people, strong people, and soft times create soft people. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I mean, there's, I think there's, I mean, generalistically speaking, not to say that everyone that grew up 
having life a little bit easy is soft or weak yeah. by any stretch. Yeah. But it's there's a there's a truth statistically to that. And uh, and so yeah, I saw that and that's what I started to recognize as something that I really appreciated uh, yeah. when I got older in being willing to work for something and not willing to give up. And when I came up against barriers, when I came up against something that wasn't right, it uh, I was like, okay, that's not working. Let's try a different route. Let's try and climb over the wall because walking through it isn't working for us. Or let's dig under it. Or let's see if there's another yeah. corner that we can go through. Or, and how you much know, you so value helped. it once you've got to the other side. Absolutely. Yeah. But your brother, I'm curious, your brother that because we all get it sometime in life. If we don't get it when we're young, we get it when we're older. I'm sure that, you know, he hasn't had like the easiest path his entire life. I mean, maybe some people have, <laughs> but I've never met anyone that's had it all easy. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. 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 And I think that like, definitely he's, he's come up with some challenges on, in his life on his own that were a bit surprising to him and some lessons that he's had to learn. And I think some more, I mean, I still have more that I need to learn. So, we all do. you know, <laughs> yeah. I, I think that, you know, there's still some lessons there that, that are available for him to learn that would be really valuable that maybe I haven't had to deal with because I had a different, even though we had the same parents, we had a different upbringing. And, uh, and so, yeah, it was, it was really interesting kind of growing up in that group, uh, in that school, in that environment, because when people talk about um, what did you, like when you asked, well, what did you think about you were going to be? What did 10-year-old Steve want to be when he grew up? And honestly, growing up in a, in a church where it was, you know, they believed the rapture was imminent and it, we were all going to be taken away. I really? just kept on thinking, oh yeah. I just kept on thinking, I just hope that God tarries long enough that I can graduate or that I can get married maybe. And, wow. and uh and then some days you're like, oh, I just want God to come and take me away right now because life is too hard. But do but, you find it hard to feel a sense of safety now as you're older? Because, because do you not, do you ha not have problems with feeling safe growing up worrying about the end of days? Um, I was more morbidly fascinated with the end of days and I would have dreams often, lots of dreams when I was younger. Um, which a lot of people might find incredibly scarring. And maybe they were, but I had lots of dreams. Most of my nightmares were of being left behind, of being that one person that wasn't taken up in the air and gone to heaven. And I was left on earth trying to fend off, you know, like a, an apocalyptic event and uh, trying to survive through that. That was my, those were my nightmares. So if you ever get uh, bored with narrating, you can be a writer. <laughs> because... <laughs> so, so where did you do after school? You're out in this world. You've had this upbringing. What's your first step? I was adrift, really, um, because, like I said, I was one of the first people to graduate in my family. So that was the goal was just please finish school, please finish school, please finish school. Nobody really talked to me about what are you going to do after you're done? Because they thought the world was going to end, so they didn't think they'd have to deal with <laughs> Really, you know, like, <laughs> and if you weren't not, doing well half the time, they probably thought you'd take so long. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of my, a lot of my thoughts, if I were ever to do anything after school or after uh, graduation, uh, I had two thoughts. One was to go into full-time ministry and be like a pastor or something like that. And another right. was to go into chiropractic or massage therapy. Um, okay. I had lived for drama. I loved, I had won all the fine arts awards every year and, and, uh, loved being in the plays and doing all of that kind of stuff. My, my drama teacher, uh, actually presented the award my grade 12 year to me. And, uh, I didn't know it was for me at the time when they were talking and they were crying and they were talking about how they had just determined to challenge me that year to make it because it seemed like everything that they gave me, uh, as a role or as a, as a as a task during the three years or two years that they had taught me was that uh, it, I just, everything was so easy. And so they had determined to challenge me and they, they were trying to come up with ways that they could do that. And they cried and it was just really special and appreciative for me that they had thought so much of me. So but, why were you thinking chiropractic and then not drama? Well, because I mean, I love that. And everyone at high school was like, Oh yeah, you're going to be the kid that goes off to Hollywood and becomes an actor and does all that yeah. kind of stuff. But I had a lot of people, I, I had the ugly duckling syndrome as far as like not being talented or skilled. I had grown up being tortured and tormented and told I wasn't good enough 
um, my whole life, even into the point where I was, I was pretty popular in school. I was uh, valedictorian. I was captain of the basketball team. I was captain of the volleyball team. I had won. There was my grade 11 year. Uh, one of the teachers got, or one of the parents of the students got really mad and complained to the principal because it was, I was laughing during awards night because it just, I would barely be able to sit down and they would be calling me up for another award. Mind you, never in a, academics, but everything else. And, uh, and so I, even with all of that, a lot of people thought I was arrogant, but I still felt like I wasn't any good because I had a lot of people that told me I wasn't really good. And, and even that's, the people that's who seemed where, to be... that's where people see arrogance. If you have the people that appear to other people to be arrogant are always the most insecure because that's why it comes off, comes across as arrogance. I don't know why. I think, I think human beings we're predators in that way. Mm. And we subconsciously sense when someone's insecure. And if they don't act like it, and we're sensing they are, we attack. Because mm. we want to bring them back down to their level. Because we can talk all we want about great communities and everyone loving each other. But human beings are predators. And subconsciously, the strongest survive. And you you subconsciously sense weakness. I know that's horrible to say, but I don't know where that came from. <laughs> but yeah, I think that's why people see that confidence. You have if you're if you're if you appear confident, you gotta like feel it. Because mm. the people I know that feel confident, every, nobody feels confident all the time. But the people that feel confident in what they do, they have something they've done that they're proud of. You mm. don't see them being brought down so much. Nobody's going to say, let me just, nobody's going to say Hillary Huber is arrogant, right? We're all going to say, oh my God, she's so talented because she's confident, confident, and she's kind of like given herself things that she's confident about. Mm -hmm. But if, but I think if she was like deep down a really insecure person, then people would be wanting to take her down. You know what I mean? Because you seem very confident now. Like, I bet, have you worked on that? Like, to get that feeling that that's a hard-earned skill. You seem very confident in yourself now. I mean, you have to be, or you wouldn't have had, you wouldn't have had the confidence to be as authentic and admit that that's how you used to feel if you didn't have an inborn confidence now, right? Yeah, I think... Yeah, I, yeah, I think what happened for me was, um, I don't know where quite it came from. I know that my mom really had my back and was in my corner. Uh, but growing up, I had a lot of people, even the people who seemed to be in my corner, I had a, a, a leader uh, in my life who was my basketball coach, my youth pastor, all of that kind of stuff. And, but he was quite young and so, and pretty competitive. We were all competitive. And so when I got to the age where we were able, like I was old enough that I could arguably compete with him playing basketball or card mm. games or whatever, he would try and win because he still had that need to, to the win. Subconscious predator. Yeah. Yeah. And so as soon as I became bigger and stronger and faster so that he couldn't necessarily beat me with skill, he would use mind games and uh, would like try and manipulate me to be like, you can never finish. You're not a finisher. You'll never, you might get ahead, you might win, but you won't finish. You won't, you won't ever be able to do that. And he would try and get into my head so that I would screw up that I'd make a mistake and then he would win whatever we were playing, chess, darts, whatever. And that affected me for a long, long time, well into my adulthood to the point where I genuinely believed and not just because of that, there was a lot of family history there as well, but I genuinely believed that I would maybe make it about six months of being successful and then it would all fall apart for whatever reason. And I would feel this impending doom happen of like, it's been a while that things are kind of going good. And then you create it. Go you create it. Yeah. And, uh, and I would feel your energy. Yeah. But somewhere along the way, like there was a lot of that with my brothers having that, especially my older brothers would have that same challenge and they would let it drag them down and give up or not try. But I don't know what it was about me that just decided that if I was going to fail at something, well, then I would just try something else. Well, I would try again and try harder. And I was determined to be better. And I felt like there was, I had a lot of people that I was around a lot of, not a lot of friends, but like 
all of my friends that I had growing up were extremely talented at a lot of things, like to the point of embarrassingly gifted. And so I always felt inferior to everyone. And it was always like a challenge for me to, to catch up or to keep up or to do something that was better. And so that allowed me to really be okay with failing because I had grown up my whole life failing. And if I wasn't failing, then I wasn't living. So yeah. I would just try again until I got it right, or I would work harder to make it work for myself. And that eventually worked in the way that I had had kind of a breakthrough in my realization that I didn't need to, it was brought to my attention. It was a book that I read called Blessings and Cursings. And it talked about how this idea, this mentality of you're not good enough and you'll never be good enough was a curse that was placed over me that I was allowing to have reign over my life, that I was allowing to dictate how successful I would be. And when I decided that's not going to be part of me anymore, I'm not going to let that affect me anymore. There was a massive shift and a big change. And one of the- Was it instant? Was that instant? Just to just, because I'm wondering if you can make a change like that by an instant decision. I'm not going to be this person anymore. I wonder if that's possible. I think it it's two part. I think it is instant that you can make that decision, but then you have to keep making that decision every day. Because you're triggered by all the things that caused you to think it before. So you right. have to remind because yourself. We're creatures of habit, right? We follow this yeah. direction, this path. And until we intentionally start trying to forge a new path, um, we're not going to be able to, to, to get off of the old path. And then when you're coming up to that same crossroads, your habit, your, your, you know, your way you're used to going is just to follow that easy path that you've known. And every time you come to a decision, it's like, do I take this easy way that I'm used to, or do I try and forge this new path? And you have to make that decision each time you come to it, come to a crossroads to go that way that you're wanting to go. And, and then it so, carves the grooves in your brain, which exactly. become, that's when I became a vegetarian. I remember my husband decided to become a vegetarian. I'd been lying and telling everyone I was for years, but I'm Italian, you know? So I thought, well, he'll only last a week. So I agreed. And then he just kept going and kept going. So I went to this conference in Glasgow and ate the biggest burger you've ever seen in your life. And <laughs> so a few times I was tempted, but that was like 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Now, if you tied me down and forced meat in my mouth, I'd be I can't, I can't, nothing in the world could make me eat meat because mm. I'm not that person. I can't even remember that person. So I yeah. think maybe that's what it is. You, you, you're not instantaneously the new person, but you can instantaneously make the decision to become the new person, right? Exactly. And then yeah. just maybe have one or two really sloppy burgers on the road. Well, and yeah, that's, I mean, I think that's what it comes to whenever you're doing anything, right? Is you might quote unquote backslide or you have a, you know, some meat one day, or you have a, you're determined to start exercising. And then you have one day where you, you know, don't go and exercise. And you're like, oh, and you can allow that to go, well, I failed. I might as well give up because I'm never going to get this. Or you can accept it and go, yeah, I made a mistake, but tomorrow's a new day. We'll try again. And uh, I started trying to make choices for myself. I started changing the narrative of how I talked about myself. I used to really get down on myself. If I made a mistake or if I did something wrong or I had, you know, made a wrong choice or, or done something stupid, I'd be like, oh, Steve, you're such a loser. You can't get anything right. And my negative self-talk was so pervasive and so overwhelming. It was really, really challenging. That was the biggest thing for me was changing the narrative of how I talked to myself and how I chose to look at my successes and my failures and then Told looking at my different failures stories. Yeah. As opportunities yeah. to, well, now you've learned, you've learned not to do it that way. So let's try it a different way. And through that, I ended up my youth pastor slash coach person that had been that continued you, to be in my life. You punched him in the up, face. Well, no, no, no. Oh, I, we, we had <laughs> no. our, we had our fights, no question, but he ended up becoming my brother-in-law amazingly enough. So he stayed in my life for a long time. Oh, okay. And, uh, um, I started changing this mentality about myself and we had played chess against each other for 25 years and I'd never even come close to beating him. 
he would always beat me. I might be winning. I might have something where I should have won dead to rights. And he would just start the mind game of, yeah, you can, you can do really well, but you can't finish, Steve. You can never finish. And then I would inevitably screw up and he would win the game. And he'd say like, see, see, and it would just be the self-fulfilling prophecy. And so then I decided I'm not handling, I'm not taking this anymore on this side. And I thought, I'm going to start working at becoming a better chess player. And so I started working at it. And then we started playing more often. And then I won my first game against him. And he was shocked. He sat at, sat at the board for like 15 minutes, just staring at it because he couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it that I'd actually won. And that broke something in my mind that was holding me back for a long time. And from that point, that was a real big turning point in my life that allowed me to um, start believing that I could actually accomplish things and I could finish and I could make changes. And that was in my 20, maybe even my 30s. I think it was in my thirties by the time that hit. And, uh, and it was, it was something then where I was able to beat him at everything that we had always competed against. And it was to the point where it was like, I wasn't even, it wasn't a concern about beating him anymore. It yeah. wasn't, that wasn't what the issue was about. It was about trying to be as good as I can be. And I think that changed in me. And I think what allowed me to become a little bit more confident in who I was was knowing how many mistakes I had made and how many times I had screwed up and people had been willing to forgive me and learning how to forgive myself for the mistakes I made, which was a lot harder. Mm -hmm. um, but that allowed me to be okay with losing, to be okay with sucking at something for a while and, uh, and yet not being willing to say, like a lot of people, they won't try something for the fear of failing for the fear of looking stupid or sucking yeah, at the it. picture of life, the nice painting of your life on the wall, rather than the messy, get your feet in the middle of it, sticky, gooey mess of a life and jumping mm -hmm. into it. And yeah. it sounds like you jumped. I did. And I, you know, it's funny. I was actually talking about this earlier today. There was a book that I had read uh, that was called World War Z by Max Brooks. And what I found fascinating is I'd always been particularly handy with my hands and I'd worked at construction for, you know, like 20 years, I think. But um, I had had, uh, I had been willing to try different things and learn different stuff. And, and, but there were certain things that I wouldn't, I wouldn't bother with. Cause I was like, Oh, I don't know how to do that. I wouldn't try it. And I'd read this book and in the book, they had talked about the people who were really valuable, weren't the executives or the big corporate headwig people, the ones that, had been important in Hollywood or whatever, because it was the person who was, I think it was the governor of California at the time or whatever. And uh, he says, those people were useless after the apocalypse. They weren't, they didn't have anything of practical value that they could contribute to society. The people who were really valuable were the custodians and the janitors and the people who had known how to cook and bake or, you know, the farmers who had been on their, on their land for 20 years and been maintaining the same tractor because they knew how to fix it and how to repair it and work on all these things. And I was like, wow, that's really incredible. And uh, shortly after that, the dishwasher in our house started leaking a lot. And I was like, oh, great. I got to call a repairman and bring him in and that's going to cost a whole bunch of money. Or do we just go and buy a new one? And, and then I thought, you know, I wonder maybe, I mean, if we're going to have to buy a new one, if we're going to, I might as well just take a look at it myself. I may not be able to know what's going on, but even if I just check it out and I had no electrical experience or whatever, but I was able to look at it, figure out how to detach the built-in dishwasher, pull it out, look and find the leak that was there, see that it was leaking and go, oh, I see this leak here. Okay, that's where water's dripping from. You are well, so brave. Our smoke alarm died and it, we're talking <laughs> massive drama. <laughs> you would have and, thought. We were ready to just yeah. move out rather than deal with it. <laughs> and it was just a battery. <laughs> You're brave. Well, it was just, but it wasn't, it, I mean, you could call it bravery, but it was just more a willingness to see, a willingness to try. Because it's like, worst case scenario, I pull this apart, I can't put it back together and we're going to have to replace it anyways. So, you know, but really. It's a good way to be, isn't it? I want to get more like that because the problem is the more you shield yourself from, especially in this modern life, ever having to fix anything, even changing a battery, it's like those people that can't leave the agoraphobics. Mm. The less you leave, the harder it is. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? The less you do, the harder it is to do it. I was thinking that the other day, because when you're young, you just eat 
anything and don't think too much about it. You, you, you know, I would just take whatever, if a friend handed me a pill and said, this will help you lose weight, I'd be, oh, okay, take two or three, you know, now it's yeah. like, take a vitamin C, you have to read 24 labels, get the mic, you know, the microscope out, make sure it's going to mix with anything else. And it's, we've become wusses. <laughs> we've allowed a lot of things. Well, we've allowed a, a lot of technology and stuff to do all of our things for us, right? Yeah. And uh, and I know that that's. I mean, we used to remember every single phone number of every single person that we knew. We had it right? locked in our brains. Yeah. Now it's like I don't. I have no idea what what number that is because my phone remembers it for me. I have and, a landline uh, and I don't know the number and I don't know where <laughs> I can find it either. <laughs> yeah, it's it's weird. It's we've we've changed more, but I like the dishwasher analogy. You should do that with more things like, Oh, maybe I can fix this. And then you'll be prepared for the apocalypse. <laughs> and, I, and I have, I, I mean, the beauty, the beauty thing is, is that I was able to look it up. I found the instruction manual online. I found a parts list, was able to look up the part that was there that I saw that I needed, found a, a supply place in, in my city that carried that part, went and got it replaced it and it cost me $38 to fix my dishwasher. And it's working. Uh, and it's, it's been working now for, well, that was probably seven years ago. That's brilliant. And if the house was going to burn down because of it, it would have by now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It would have, it would have exploded by now if it was there. And but Lisa says, Lisa says, might as well fiddle with it. It's already broken. It's a very helpful attitude. We could apply that to pretty much everything in life, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the thing, the thing that my my mom said that she appreciated about me that was different about my brothers. And it's something that uh, I think Cindy Kay had done a TikTok talking about this. Um, was, are you the type of person that wants to uh, figure it out for yourself and you don't want to ask for help? Or are you the type of person who likes to ask for help and ask experts what they think? And I had always been of the mindset that someone else has already done this. Someone else has already made the mistakes or someone else has already tried to work this out or been there before me. And I learned that fairly early on talking to my mom. And she said, I appreciate when I have conversations with you, you listen to me and you know that I've been there and that I've done that. And you try to listen to me where, whereas my brothers would be like, okay, mom, yeah, whatever. And, uh, and so I had really gravitated towards that. And there was a quote I heard, uh, at one point that said, um, Experience is a great teacher, but a hard taskmaster, because first you get the test, then you get the lesson. And that's, I mean, you're going to, chances are you might pass the test, but if you don't know anything about what you're trying to, what you're being tested on, chances are you may fail. Now you've learned a lot by failing, but you failed first and then you get, you get but to if learn. if you don't try, you don't even learn from failing. You don't even get it, that part of the lesson. Exactly. But that's, and that's where I, I'm not afraid to try. But yeah. I'm also not afraid to ask for information. And uh, I think that that helped me a lot when I was starting out in narration because I didn't right away start asking questions. But what I did was did, did as much research as I could on my own. And then um, I had the opportunity to be invited because in Canada, we didn't have ACX at the time. So the ACX narrator group that was on Facebook, I couldn't have access to because you're supposed to have an, a, an account. And it ended up that Don Barnes, I had hired him to teach me about um, audio editing. And uh, I told him about this and he's like, well, I'm an admin on that group. So I'll let you in. It won't be a big deal. I'll make sure that it's fine. Um, just, you know, go about your business quietly in there and then you can learn some stuff. So I spent, I think the first three months just reading older posts or following along and seeing the new questions that were being asked, maybe questions that I would have asked um, unknowingly and then seeing people be like, uh, that's a dumb question. You shouldn't have asked that or whatever. And I was like, oh, good thing they asked. And I didn't because I didn't want to appear dumb. And so I learned a lot from just following that and then getting that information. And then when I felt like I had hit a place where here's a question that I have that I haven't seen an answer anywhere, I would try and find someone that maybe would have the answer and ask them. And then we'd get the answer that I, that worked for me and go go that route. And I always felt like, I had learned enough in life that if you follow any one person, um, inevitably they'll let you down and no one knows everything. And just because, and especially when I was in construction, 
knowing one way to tape a house wasn't always the best way to do it. So I would try and learn from a bunch of different people who all did it differently, analyze why they're doing it differently, what they're doing differently, and then see what applied to what I could do best and what was just garbage and I could throw away for me personally. And then when it came to narrating and getting coaching and doing that stuff, that's how I tried to apply it. Let me get a broad spectrum view of what a lot of people that are considered experts in the field, see where they agree all collectively, collectively see where they differ and then yeah. take that information and, uh, and compile it into what works best for me. Respect. And you respect, I had an experience and I've got two questions come up and they were right where I wanted to go as well, but I've just got so carried away. This is fascinating. Um, two, I think the two elements go hand in hand. You always have to know deep down that you know better about your own business than anyone else. You do. You're the last word. Listen to advice and then come back to yourself. But be a little respectful. Seriously, that's what we're saying about like, maybe choose your coach if they've narrated an audiobook in the past. <laughs> and, you know, they, they know what they're doing. So that brings us to um, what I really... Um, and I wanted to know this too. Burke asked a question and Jonathan asked a question. Um, how did you, uh, we'll start with Burke's. Um, he says he fell into an IT tech career, even though he was a music major. How did you get into the tech side of things? And I'm assuming it was first, right? I think from your website, you were a tech first before you became a narrator. I was, I, I on my website, I talk about always being a techie in the fact that it was, I, w I wasn't a professional technician. I wasn't in IT. I was just someone who is fascinated by technology. And yeah. so I was a self-taught, learn as much as I could about a, a lot of different stuff. And so I love technology. I loved what, what was coming new and I was happy to try new things. And uh, you're one and of the so discord guys. I am. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Read in there. I, <laughs> I was one of the OG. I was one of the OG discord guys. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, it was one of those things where I, I'm happy to try new things. It was something that I, I had applied when I was in construction and uh, there would be a new tool that had come out on the market or a new thing to try. And I was like, yeah, sure. I'll give it a whirl. I'll try it out. I'll give it the, yeah. you know, the college effort as they say. And, uh, or I would, you know, it's funny when people talk about when you're talking about how um, uh, people feel like they've arrived and they know more than other people. So they yeah. won't give the time of day to people who maybe aren't as far as they are, or they don't feel as reached the level that they have. Yeah, I learned when I was in construction uh, from a lot of different people that I worked with or that I saw around as I would go and check out their work and I would hang out with tapers and I would walk in and I would see a mess, what I thought was a horrible taping job, but they were still working. And I'm like, okay, well, why are they working? And I, I quickly learned that you can take lessons from anyone, including bad tapers. And so when I got into narrating, I applied that to going, I can learn from anybody, even if I don't think they're a very good narrator. Yeah. I can learn something from them. Because you're going Maybe back to what do I think? Right. You're, you're running it through what your filter. not to do. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. you're, you're always going to learn something if you're open to learning. And also if and, you're doing the work on the side as well, because yeah. the work, that's a big success in the job isn't if you get lucky and what you've booked or however number, that's not success. Success is what you've mm -hmm. taught yourself and built on. And, and um, yeah. when did you start narrating? How did you start as an, I can't miss that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'll, I've gone over this so many times. I'll try and do it as briefly as I can. I was in construction, like I said, and I was, lis I was listening to music and it got really boring. And I was like, I need something else. I need, maybe I should be bettering myself. And so I thought if I'm listening to audiobooks rather than music, at least I'm learning something. But when you're working 10, 12, sometimes 16 hours in a day, you can burn through a lot of educational books and nonfiction books and you get pretty fatigued. Uh, very quickly. And so I thought, boy, I need to just, um, I need to uh, get something that's a little bit more entertaining. So I started listening to uh, fiction audio and fantasy stuff and 
uh, Wheel of Time was a huge series that I had loved reading and then needed to catch up on when I when I actually um, uh, when the books started coming out and Brandon Sanderson was right was writing them. And so I got into listening to the Wheel of Time, which was awesome because when you're doing pulling long days, having those giant tomes that are the Wheel of Time uh, done by Michael Kramer and Kate Redding. It was, yeah, it was really great. And that's when I really started falling in love with audiobooks, was listening to those two masters just astound me with their abilities and their prose and their inflection and their characters and their everything was just like, wow, wow, wow. And I was yeah. fascinated by it. And so my latent acting brain started going, ooh, this is really good. And I'd always been a storyteller. I loved telling stories. I loved to talk, clearly. And, uh, <laughs> we and all so, do, or we wouldn't be here. <laughs> <laughs> so then I started listening to audiobooks in a different way and started analyzing what I liked and what I didn't like. And then when I would come home and I'd be reading to my boys, I started trying to, you know, those bedtime stories started taking on a whole new dimension for me. And, uh, and it started to be where I would be listening to an audiobook and going, oh, ah, well, why, why, why would they make, why would they do that? That's not, I love this. I've got right. this picture of your boys going, dad, we, we got to go to sleep now. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, it was never that. They wanted me to keep reading, oh, and, but they that. would give me grief because they would say, um, that's, that's not his voice. That's not the way he sounds. The Pegasus <laughs> didn't sound like that, Dad. Do the Pegasus voice. And I was like, oh, geez, what was the Pegasus voice that I used last time? That's good training. How did that work? It was. It was. Yeah. And so it got me fascinated with audiobook narration, where I wasn't even considering it as a job, but I was still going on to YouTube and, and Googling, where can I see how these narrators are doing this? Because Surely they must be making mistakes. Like I how, okay, read Steve the Campbell, entire book? you're a genius. Right there, right there. And that was me too. Loving it for the sake of loving it before you actually thought about doing it. Like mm -hmm. just because pure love. And, yeah. and fascination. I used to listen and try to analyze. It's that pure love for the sake of it. I think yeah. that's, it gets in your heart. Oh, it does, for point, sure. At what point did you start to think, maybe I could do I was, this? I was listening to a book that was really popular. Um, and I listened to the audiobook narration of it. And I've been, like I said, I've been checking out narrators and listening or seeing different small stuff. And at that point, nobody was doing anything on, you know, Twitter wasn't even, or sorry, TikTok wasn't even really a thing. Nobody was streaming their sessions. Nothing like that was happening. But uh, what little I could find of, of whoever, I was just scrounging up and uh, interviews and different promotions that Audible was doing with different uh, recording artists or whatever. And I was listening to a book and I was like, oh man, this is, this is how did they get hired to do this? Like who, clearly they must've been paid. Well, who, who, <laughs> who gets hired for that? How do you get paid for this kind yeah, of stuff? That I remember doesn't make sense. That. Like they must've been doing this. And so then I thought, man, this is not great. I could do a better job than this guy. And then I thought, I could do a better job than this guy. How, how is this a job? And so that changed my Google search to how do you become an audiobook narrator? How do you get into it? And that showed me a few videos, one of them being Sean Pratt's now infamous uh, or famous, I guess you should say. Um, so you want to be an audiobook narrator. And I was like, hmm, this is really interesting. And uh and I thought this is this is something that I would love to do, but I was still in the back of my mind that little voice that said, "You're not good enough to be doing any of this. What are you even thinking? You're not. You're not. You're a construction guy. You have a high school education at best. You know what are you what are you even trying to do here?" And so I had done tons of research research and how it works, how it goes, that they edit their stuff, and so I had gone in with my phone and Garage Band on my phone, and I went into my closet. Um, and grabbed my little ear, Apple ear pods and I plugged them in and I read a book, uh, the first chapter of a book that I really loved that I thought would, because I'd already been analyzing, I'd been thinking for months about what my voice would be working for. And I had thought, I don't have a good voice. I hate my voice. I thought I had, it was nasally. Nobody would find me interesting to listen to, but I had heard an interview during my research with Jeff Kafer 
that he had always said, there's a book for every voice and a voice for every book. Well, so your and voice like, isn't nasally at all, like at well, all. I've worked on it. I've worked on it. <laughs> I mean, has it changed Maybe. significantly or do you think just the way you hear it has changed? I think, I think that I've, I've, I've definitely worked on it. Um, my, my more, my voice that I used to have more, and it's not changed a lot. Definitely. I've just had to learn how to accept my voice, but when I get excited, I get really like, I get up higher and pitcher and then I kind of have more of that nasally sound, but that was just, I had to try and calm myself down and be like, okay, you can, you can talk more out of your chest. You don't need to be talking out of the back of your throat. Cause um, I, I have a theory. Um, when I was young, I used to, long story, I used to take my boyfriend's phone calls and analyze them with my little sister afterwards when I was like 15 wow. years old. Wow. Um, got those little plugs from Radio Shack that you could hook onto the phone, suction cup plug and record the call. Oh, yeah. um, but I hated my voice the first time I heard it. And then mm. I noticed after a few months listening back to it, I didn't hate my voice anymore. And I thought, oh, my voice kind of changed. But doing these videos, I thought I was so ugly. I was like, was, was I thinking I'm going to go on a YouTube call? And I remember putting on Facebook after we started the Joe calls, going, seriously, people, am I cross-eyed? Why am I cross-eyed? What? And looking up Google tutorials, how do you not look cross-eyed on YouTube? And, <laughs> and like, now I just look the same as I think I do in my head. And it's the mm -hmm. same with the voice. I'm so used to hearing it. I sound the same as I think I do when I think that, we're so much in our thoughts yeah. that that we have a perception of what we are. And it's, and you, you marry the two when you start noticing it and then you get used to it and it becomes like normal. Do you know what I mean? So I, I bet do. your voice hasn't yeah. changed that much. You just had a perception of it. And yeah. now you're a professional narrator, you know, you've got a deep baritone or whatever, and you're, you're fine. You know what I mean? It's like, I know I'm gorgeous now. I sh I'll rock up on any video. <laughs> In my pajamas yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it at first it's disconcerting mm -hmm. it is and i had i had heard or seen my voice in different videos or home movies or something like that and was like oh gosh i sound awful i don't like this at all <laughs> and so yeah it was it was definitely a big change for me to kind of go into that um getting used to hearing my own voice and i've gotten to the place where i'm used to hearing my own voice but there's still moments where i go Oh man, that sounds really like I'm not loving it. I'm not loving it. How did um, you feel after your when your first but was it ACX book released or was it somewhere else? Your it first was, book? Yeah. No, it was through feel? ACX. How did it feel? Uh incredibly exciting. Yeah, to, when it's like, on Audible. Yeah. Yeah. It was really exciting. Really yeah. exciting. Jonathan has a question I don't want to miss, and this is a good time for it. And was your first, did your first book fit into this category? I'll add to his question. What genres do you enjoy narrating and what genres will you not narrate? Um, the genres that I enjoy narrating the most, lit RPG has become my passion. I always loved fantasy and I love sci-fi and I love that kind of, that kind of uh, genres. Um, I find them just more adventurous and interesting and characters are a little bit larger than life and, and lit RPG is like an amped up version of that. And so that's my favorite genre to narrate in. I do a lot of it and I'm really grateful that I get to do a lot of it. My first book was an allegorical fantasy uh, that was actually given to me by a friend, uh, a very dear friend who's like a surrogate mom who had actually written when I had said that this is what I want to do. Um, and started started that journey. Uh, she had written a couple of books, and she says, "Well, you can practice on my books." And I was like, "Well, I, I don't want." And she's like, "Well, no, we can do it actually through everything. We'll get it all worked out, but you can just consider it a practice until you get some real books that you're ready to do." And so, I was honored, wow. and I thought that was great. So I got a chance to do that, but because I was, I started. Um, let me back up half a second because I'll finish this thought really quickly. So I recorded that little thing and I sent it to a few of my friends who listen to audiobooks. And I was like, do you think that I could maybe actually do this? And they're like, I would 100% listen to you. I would 100% listen to this. And then it took me about three months before I was willing to go to my wife and say, okay, so I want you to listen to this and tell me what you think. And that was my great litmus test because my wife is the amazing person that as I come up with brilliant ideas of what I'm going to do next, she's like, mm, no, mm, yeah, probably not. And this one, she's like, 
you could do this. You're and not, it's so weird hearing you say this because everyone knows your narration. You're one of those narrators that you're, you're overwhelmingly known as one of the good, narr- a really good narrator. And it's so odd hearing <laughs> you question that. I mean, I know in the beginning we all have like our things, but isn't that strange? Do you know what I mean? That like the way I everyone understand else what you sees mean. you. It doesn't feel strange to me by any stretch. I still, to this day, I still get that feeling of like, okay, at any moment, someone is going to wise up and be like, we, some, everyone's been hypnotized and they're all going to wake up and be like, what were we thinking? Listening to Steve Campbell. That guy is such a hack. Oh my goodness. Okay. That's enough. No more for Steve Campbell. He needs See, to be out. That's, I still that's get how that I feel about working have to, from home. I have I to think fight somebody's it every gonna, day. Yeah. But you've got imposter syndrome then. Oh, 100%. Sometimes. Yeah. Oh yeah. For sure. But so I'll just, t- but just make a decision right now not to have it anymore because I can tell <laughs> you it's wrong. <laughs> right there. Yeah. The decision has been made. I, uh, so yeah, it ended up that um, uh, I got that book and I, I, my wife said it was cool for me to start going into this. Uh, that was in fall, winter of 2016. And so I started really my, again, my Google searching started switching into the real practicalities. I had already started on that path and now I was really going into it. So I took three months of trying to figure out what kind of mic I should have, what kind of, uh, yeah. do I like learning that I needed an interface, learning that I should have a, uh, a, an XLR mic instead of a USB mic that I needed to have a DAW and then learning, okay, my DAW can't just be audacity. I should be getting something better. I need to learn punch and roll. So I started learning that kind of stuff. And then I reached out <laughs> when I decided that this was a path I was going to start going on. I had very, I don't know, I guess brazenly is perhaps the best way to put it, reached out to Michael Kramer and Kate Redding because they were my inspiration and told them, you're my inspiration. I love what you do. You're incredible. And I just want to let you know that I want to, you've made me want to become a narrator and I'm starting on this journey. And, uh, and uh, I wanted, I actually wanted to try and see if they would do any coaching. And they're like, we don't do coaching, but you could reach out to Sean Pratt. He's a friend of ours and he's a brilliant coach. And so I said, okay. So I contacted Sean Pratt and Sean Pratt said, no, you don't really want to be a narrator. I, well, he didn't say, no, he didn't say that. He said, I actually, most of the people that I work with uh, as narrators are people that have done a couple of books. They kind of have learned a little bit of the ropes and uh, my curriculum is a little bit more intensive. So someone starting out of the gate might get overwhelmed and intimidated and just quit. So it's probably best that you start coaching with someone else before you, before you start working with me. And of course, I've been told most of my life that, no, you're probably not, you're not ready. You're not ready to go or whatever. And so I was like, okay, fair enough. If he feels that way, but I send him a reply back going, I appreciate your candor and I respect your decision. However, what excited me about working with you was seeing how your curriculum was set up and based and all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, I'm all in if that's what, if that's, what's there for it. And he's like, really? Okay. Well, yeah, we can, we can go from there. And he was, he was testing because I mean, and he even says in that, so you want to be a narrator, which you didn't realize until afterwards that he talks about, you know, he would have people go, I want to do this. I want to do that. And then he would spend a whole bunch of time with them. And then they would just go, yeah, that's not for me. And not do anything with it. You made and me so remember like, oh, something. It's really hard. You, you made me remember because I, I started um, at the RNIB and I kind of brazenly showed up and pre- I didn't lie and say that I had done an audiobook before but I might not have mentioned that I hadn't. I'd done mm. voiceover and burlesque and I was an actress. I figured, you know, how hard could it be? Then I got in a studio and it was like an eight hour book in three days or something like mm. that. And I, But oh, I wow. did two books and I remember after, I didn't have a clue. I thought I was great. So I'd be in the waiting room with, they must be like the top narrators. I didn't know who they were. Chatting away, everyone's trying to save their voice and being all serious. And I remember after the second book, I said to the guy there, I said to him, I'm going to be a full-time narrator. This is all I want to do for the rest of my life, every single minute of every single day. Mm. And he said, don't quit your job, right? And now I know looking back that he was saying that because he probably sees a million people and he knows how hard the journey is. And I get that, right? Not because Mm -hmm. I'm horrible and he heard something in my voice that wasn't going to make it, right? 
But I think right then, because my whole life, I would have gone, well, that's it. I'm not going to bother. I'll do something else. Yeah. That's what happened to me many acting jobs, many times in everything in life. And I walked out on the street and I called my friend from work. I was like going to cry. And instead, I'm in the middle of Soho where everyone's a very cool. I thought it was, I think it was Soho. I jumped up and down and screamed at the top of my lungs. <laughs> it didn't matter. It was the first thing in my life ever. It didn't matter if someone else thought I couldn't do it. Yeah. It still doesn't matter. If if everyone in the world decided I was a horrible narrator, I would probably still do public domain books. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It's I do. It's yeah. it's not listening. And for you, from what you've said about the way you were raised and the criticism you received, that is big for you to come back to Sean. That was me. I'm gonna do it anyway, even though you gave me that look of someone that's a person in authority that obviously knows I would be making a mistake. I'm making that mm -hmm. mistake anyway. And you did yeah. that to Sean. And that is like a life-changing moment, don't you think? That's like a pivot. It is. Well, it was, I mean, it was something that I had learned in other areas where you just, I've been told I couldn't do things for my whole life or that I wasn't yeah. good or I wasn't whatever. So someone telling me again that I wasn't ready or I wasn't good enough was not, that wasn't surprising to me. That's not, uh, that's not something I was uncommon, that was uncommon for me to hear. It just meant that I had to prove them wrong. I had to show them that I was, yeah. that I was going to do it. And, uh, and so it, from there, we started taking, I started taking his training and his courses and I started, uh, I hired Don Barnes to teach me how to do uh, the proper way to do all the editing and audio and how to work the DAW and all that kind of stuff. And then I learned very, very early on that although ACX was this great platform where you could cut your teeth and kind of get started and maybe get a few credits or whatever, um, it wasn't available in Canada. And so I had months where I could practice and I could look at where could I get started, what avenues could I get into to start getting ready. And I couldn't just approach all the publishers because I wasn't quite ready for that. So mm -hmm. I was still working full-time in construction. I had my own construction company. And so I would go to work at, I would drop my boys off at school. I would go right to work and I would work until about six or seven o'clock at night. I would come home and do all my paperwork and invoicing and all that stuff till, uh, you know, uh, after supper till it was time to put the boys to bed. I put the boys to bed. Then, you know, 10 o'clock at night, I would get into the booth which was just this blanket fort and I would practice. I had a book and I would record and work on it. Um, what, were your boys aware of this? Midnight. Yeah. Yeah. They kind of knew what I was doing. What a great what gift on. for them. What a great and, gift for them to see someone to see. What a great gift. Think about that. What you've given them hmm. for life. I hope so. The, I hope that I've yeah. given them the, the knowledge that you can, try something new you can yeah. risk not being awesome at something or change what you're doing and and be adventurous like that and we had a lot of we had a lot of people in our life uh my father-in-law our accountant who wouldn't say anything to me but would go to my wife and go so how long are you gonna let steve play around with this before you uh tell him to knock it off oh, and God. uh and so she was like he he really is passionate about it and he's working towards it and and that's just the way it's going to be and so i felt an immense amount of pressure to get going with it and do well with it but i was working really hard at construction trying to make it work and then working at this and and uh doing it in the evenings and then in june of 2017 uh acx opened up to canada and i had everything ready to go i'd been working on my demos with sean i had all of my <laughs> stuff ready i'd already practiced you're waving so canadian was, flags out the yeah. window <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I just on my discord here, uh, was it last week or a week or two ago, I was talking about this very thing. And I had said that, uh, I actually wrote ACX a letter, um, uh, saying we need, you need to open us up to Canada. And I had done it. And I wanted it to, to be memorable. I thought I want to have a letter that is going to be passed around there, uh, passed around the people that they just can't ignore. So I made, it was probably one of maybe 
you, one of those things that's either going to ruin your career or make your career, basically. And so I wrote a letter that was extremely, I called them sexist. I called them racist. I like, I mean, I wrote one of those letters once and I still have nightmares. (laughs) In a tongue in cheek fashion, I did. But I wrote a letter that was just like, what are you doing? Like, you can't be racist towards Canadians. And I'm, you know, I promise not to say a at the end of every sentence. And, you know, I had talked about, you know, moose trails and bunny trails. And, and uh, like, I just, I made it as obnoxiously ridiculous. I read it, I actually read it on my discord, and they were all hit, like laughing re- uproariously, couldn't believe that I had written that and sent it to them. They responded. And, uh, and so I responded back to the response. And a couple months later, it opened Wonderful. up in Canada. So, I mean, I'm not going to say that it was the reason not gonna that it was you, Canada, but I'm but not, not going to say it was not it. either. <laughs> so, yeah, that uh, that was a big, a big win for me. And so then I immediately made my account, set my profile up on ACX and within two hours had an offer. And then uh, I think it was like 45 minutes later, I had a second offer for another book. Now, their books weren't amazing, but one was through an independent publisher. One was through a guy that just wanted his book done. And they looked at both of the books and they were both in genres that I was really excited about and was like, this is awesome. Yeah. Okay. Let's go. So I started on my journey then and uh, haven't looked back since. Okay. I don't want to, I've kept you, kept, this is, gosh, this conversation, every single sentence I've been like, okay, we got to move along, but I'm like 20 <laughs> more things I could have said about it. I'm We've so got like sorry. four conversations worth here, Stephen. <laughs> okay. So I, don't, um, I have to ask you, in 60 years, for the YouTube audience of 60, 70,000 people that are going to be watching this, what final last words or wisdom would you like to leave them with? If they take anything away from this call, and if you or you know, a lesson you wish you'd known earlier, something that's profound, an epiphany you've had, something you'd like to leave the audience with from this call. Oh, man. You're talking to a guy who's long-winded and loves to tell people what he thinks. That's a really awful thing to do to me. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) I think the most important thing that I've learned in my life or the lesson that I keep trying to learn is it's okay to make mistakes. And it's okay to fail. Don't take yourself so seriously and enjoy what you have. Be appreciative for what you have and don't keep looking to what you don't because you will never find happiness if you seek for happiness. You will find it when you're content with what you have and you enjoy what is right in front of you and appreciate it. That's a massive, that's everything right there. Um, Ron says, Steve is our guide and friend. He has more knowledge than he realizes sometimes. He is always there to support those around him. Yeah. Oh, and that's your that. reputation in the industry as well. I mean, everyone, I didn't know you and I knew of you because kindness and support and encouragement, and that's the way you obviously live your life and who you show up as every day at work is who you're known as, mm. not like the times you fail or the things you do wrong or, you know, who you show up and that's who you show up as. That's what everyone knows you as, you know, a brilliantly talented narrator, but also who you are to other people is huge in this industry. And that's what I'm trying to tell people about respect and, you know, who you are to other people is everything. That's kind of what matters, not like what you put in your reach out letter to the publisher. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's such a small industry and everyone knows each other. We were talking about that a little bit earlier, like everyone knows each other and communicates with each other and if you get a reputation that isn't positive it doesn't take very long for that to run through every everybody's inbox or everybody's chat and i guess the same way goes when you're you know a little bit like i know i know the people that i encountered as narrators who were really kind and generous and uh giving of their time and their knowledge and i couldn't be more appreciative and uh and then compassion was something that i learned from my mom a lot and how to love people who maybe a lot of people felt were unlovable or to take the time to really get to know people because there's a lot of amazing people out there that you may never have known 
And, uh, and I just, I love getting to know people. I love getting to hear their stories about how they've like you, like your, I, your podcast is brilliant. And if, if you weren't doing it, I probably would be doing one myself, right? Just am fascinated <laughs> by what, you know, what people are doing. You and should how do one yourself life. as well. Oh gosh, Yours would be I've a been... completely different thing. You'd be amazing. <laughs> there's there's that's the thing there's so much to go around there's no limit you know people are like you don't copy we're artists we take mm -hmm. ideas and then we grow them and we make them our own ideas do you know what i mean yeah. and you should do a podcast yourself as a, how hard My, could it be <laughs> well that's that's the question is how hard is it because i know the amount of time and effort that it takes to you know some of the time and effort uh that it takes to create these podcasts and to edit them and to take all that time. And I'm like, how, how do you fit all that in? Like, how I do you kind of think that if you're else? an audiobook narrator, you already have most of the skills you need. But do you have the time that you need? <laughs> you just sort it in and doing these calls. I mean, it was only, I only thought we we're going to do one or two, but then we ended up doing like two a week. And now it's like two and a half years later, but it also saved me through all the quarantine, it made me get up and put makeup on and face people. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoy them. And it's kept me sane. And every single person you talk to is just this huge inspiration. And then you go off stronger than you were before. So I get more from these podcasts than the people watching. And yeah, the admin, you know, <laughs> it isn't the easiest thing, but it's yours. You own it. You develop shortcuts. You develop temp. Seriously, do it. Just don't think about it. Just do it. <laughs> if you did, you, are you doing construction still? No, I stopped oh, so doing that. You've got plenty in, uh, of time. Do the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're plenty used to doing two term. jobs. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, do it. Do it. Do it. I'll be looking for it in like a week or so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have I have too much work to get done recording to to get it done in a week or two. I got to try and get three more books done this month before yeah. I head off to Dragon Con. So I mean, it's... and that's the thing you w that was my rule. The pod the this jo Joe show and the editing it's at night. It mm. cannot go into my recording. My recording right. comes first. I'll have to send a message to a guest and say their video is going to be up late recording comes first do you know what i mean yeah. you have to like you know but... yeah and i and i can appreciate that and everyone is at a different point in their journey and in their life and so my nighttime is my family time with my yeah. boys with my wife so yeah. there's only so much of me to go around yeah and i want to make sure that because i'm all like you know what it's like being an audiobook narrator you're not just in the booth recording you're prepping your book, you're recording your book, you're doing your pickups. Then you have your marketing and you have your networking. You have the people that you really care about that you're wanting to keep up with and make sure that they're doing okay in the industry. And then you have your family life and you have that aspect of it. And it's, there can be a lot that goes on and trying to find the balance of- Even just sure recording alone. All those things. Yeah. It's like a shock. Like, how do you find yeah. time to like do your hair and like- you know, there's a fired up and focused challenge going on now where people are all into it. And I tried it. Anyone look it up. It's a five day challenge or something. You sign up and she tells you how like certain tasks you do are like $10 an hour. Some tasks are a hundred and you should be working on the hundred thousand dollars an hour tasks. Mm -hmm. Well, like not only are all my tasks, like the $10 an hour tasks, I spent a lot of busy time, but also, oh my God, I'm supposed to be doing all that having a business. <laughs> I mean, it's, a lot. And to be frank, I wouldn't be doing the Joe calls if anyone yeah. had told me. It was just I kind of like did one by accident and then another. And then once you're doing them, you've got a list of people. You know, you you just get addicted. I think half of what we do, if we knew what it entailed, we wouldn't do. Oh, I had that thought when I made it a certain stage of my audiobook narration. And I realized, had I known when I started yep. out, all the things that I would need at this point that I now know that I need, I never would have started. Thank goodness. I wasn't aware of how much work would have went into it. Cause I would have been like, Nope, that's too much. I gotta, I gotta try and find something else to do because there's a lot to learn. There's a but, lot, but I'm putting this in your brain. Someday you should just try one, just do one because from this call, Every single thing you said led to ha six more questions. You could do a <laughs> podcast and be fascinating, whatever twist you want to give it. But I'm telling you, 
don't just in the back of your mind, even if you just say you'll do one, see how you like it. Yeah. My, my Discordians that are on my thing just keep telling me all I should be doing is just recording my entire day of my, like my recording session. And then when I get rantier, when I start going off on some tangent and talking about something that I'm thinking about or what's going on in my life, or I'll have narrators that pop into my discord and we end up having this big long chat and discussion about stuff. And I should just take all of that, edit and edit it and use that as a podcast. I have all the content already. I just need to edit it down. And I'm like, oh, but editing it, I know. Editing it down would take so long. My goodness. The editing takes a long time. My, I wanted to turn the Joe calls into a podcast because I figure all mm. I have to do is take the header footer off, change it, open it up on a podcast platform but it's the time. It's time mm-hmm. is all over. And I'm telling you, do that challenge though. It's an interesting exercise. It made me a crazy person. And <laughs> I had now decided I'm not a businesswoman. I just don't want to do any of it. But, um, <laughs> but it is an interesting exercise. It was very, and she sends you workbooks and everything. It's like free. So, mm. okay. I better let these go. <laughs> Famous last words. I started the call with, okay, now we're going to end on time this time. <laughs> it has been fabulous. You were a joy. You should have been the host yourself. You were, oh, you outdid me. You were wonderful. Thank you so much, Steve. I'm so glad we got this chance to chat and the video will up, be up in a few weeks. Oh, I'm just honored that you asked me to do it. I have been uh, overjoyed to see these cup of joys, Joe's in, in, uh, when other people have done it. And so, yeah, I was really excited to, uh, to be asked to be on here and, uh, I'm glad yeah, we I made it, it happen. Yeah. I'm glad we made it happen. And fabulous guest. Wonderful. Open invitation. I want to Thank hear about so the much. podcast. <laughs> Thanks you guys. Thanks for joining. Mwah! Take care. Bye, Steve. See Bye-bye. you later. Bye. Bye.